Good evening, everybody. Um, and you're very welcome to this centenary event. Um, I'm Graham Chesters and, and I chair the, the Larkin Society. And it's, um, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here and such a demand for this event. Um, I want to welcome, first of all, the, the Philip Larkin Society members um, to give you thanks for all the support you give to the society, which I remind you of the charity and uh, your, your support is crucial to, to our continuation. With a... But I, I also want to thank all those people who are not members of society. And I guess you can probably imagine what I'm going to say next, which is that if you go onto the Philip Larkin Society website, you'll find a way of becoming a member of the society and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, but my main purpose really, of course, is to introduce this conversation between two fellow personalities. Um, Andrew Motion, who, who's in uh, Baltimore in the States. Uh, it's it's tremendously exciting to, to, to welcome him to, to join in this event. He's been active already, as I'm sure you will have seen. Uh, in this centenary year, as you would expect. Um, Andrew, I, I do remember when he was at the University of Hull as, as a young lecturer, slightly younger myself, and um, the thing I was particularly jealous about was his very long scarf. Um, I'm not sure whether it had any connection with, with um, Doctor Who, but it looked like it at the time. Um, and I also want to welcome Rosie, of course, Rosie Millard, who's our president and has been extraordinarily active during this year. Um, she's already had one in conversation this time last year with, with James Booth. She's um, done a, a couple of question and answer sessions at the wonderful performance of Larkin with Women at the Islington Red Lion. And there are a, another in the in conversation um, evening coming up in October with Alan Johnson. That one is live at Hull Truck Theatre. We're still working on whether we can um, live stream that. But um, it's great to have them both here. I'm going to leave it to them now and uh, hope you enjoy the evening and I hope you um, feel able to participate as well. Rosie, over to you. Thank you so much and um, good evening everyone and um, it's very very lovely to see you all. I can recognize lots of familiar names and faces and uh, for people who I haven't met before it's lovely that you've joined us on this uh, on this call. Thank you so much and um, welcome to uh, to Andrew. I can't actually see Andrew at the moment but I suspect he's on another uh, page. I've got my view on uh, speaker. You arrived at the University of Hull in 1976, and uh, between 1976 and 1980, you taught English there. It's said that you applied to Hull because Philip was there. Is that the case? Um, yes, I arrived in Hull in the autumn of 1976, aged 23. I was 24 that my first term teaching at Hull. So pretty wet behind the ears. I'd never lived in the north of England before. Um, I didn't know the north of England at all well. I'd, I'd certainly never been to Hull before, except on the day that I was interviewed for the job. Um, and it is true to say that the fact that Philip was there, had been working in the library for 20 years by the time that I applied for the job was a, a reason to take the job there seriously. Though honestly, it wasn't the only reason that I went. Um, those of you who are my age and thereabouts will remember that this was around the time that Mrs Thatcher was marching through higher education, swinging her machete around. Um, and there honestly weren't very many jobs to apply for. Um, but the fact that there was one at Hull and Philip was there made it a kind of doubly attractive thing. Um, I think I went expecting that I might occasionally see him walking around the university um, and I might have been able to pluck my courage up to go and say hello to him. And I was certainly very interested in doing that, but I didn't go with the expectation of becoming a friend of his or anything approaching that sort of status. 
and it might never have happened had my then head of department, um, the very nice um, John Chapel, the late John Chapel, um, popped his head around the corner of my door one day, my teaching room, and said that he was going to have lunch with Philip, and would I like to come as well? Lunch meant really standing up and drinking beer in the in the university staff bar. Um, so I said, of course, and went along. And you, Rosie, yourself may have heard me tell this story before, but it, this encounter got off to a kind of predictably nervous start, nervous on my part start, and perhaps nervous on his too, because by this stage, plenty of my colleagues in the English department had told me that he didn't have much time for people who worked in the university, and especially little time for people who worked in the English department, because we thought that we all talked, no he thought we all talked nonsense about poems. This, also, you were about to have a collection published, were you not? I was about to have my you. first collection published, yeah. yes, and these are poems that I'd written either as an undergraduate or um, when I was doing my research at Oxford, which was um, so very early, early things. Um, and I can see that encounter in my mind's eye still very vividly. What I first of all remember is that thing that almost always happens when you meet somebody whose picture you've seen either once or several times, several times in this case, which is a, they're never the size that you expect them to be. I mean, I, I knew that he would be a, a tall, large, quite heavy man, um, but I, he seemed to sort of loom over me, not just in a figurative sense, but actually to loom over me, leaning forward, canting forward, cupping his ear off and to catch my mumbling. Um, and as I say, this was a sort of predictably nervous encounter but then um, he took a swig of his beer and it went down the wrong way. Um, and he started coughing and spluttering quite spectacularly. So this person that I expected to be metaphorically kneeling at the feet of and felt very much in awe of was suddenly somebody who I was sort of familiarly patting on the back and asking whether he was all right and so on and so forth. And eventually he recomposed himself. And quite soon afterwards, as though he knew what the answer might be, he said, um, trying to find out, as it were, more about me. What does your father do? And I told him that my father was a brewer. Um, and his face absolutely lit up, I think, because he felt that I must come from stock that, would, that had been producing something that people actually want, alcohol, rather than something they could take or leave, poetry. <laughs> but that seemed a kind of a moment of impending friendship. And then quite soon after that, the whole Daily Mail um, organised a poetry competition for... To, to mark the opening, the about to be opening of the Humber Bridge. And there were two parts to this competition. There was a children's section and an adult section. And they asked Philip to be one of the judges, assuming I think that he'd been there too long to easily say no. And they asked me to be the other judge, perhaps assuming that I hadn't been there long enough to easily say no. Um, and I'd ex I expected that we would do this judging after lunch, sitting on the side of his desk in the library, but rather to my surprise and I must say to my delight he he said why don't you come around one evening and we'll do it over a drink at home and of course if you I mean whoever's threshold you cross it can be a significant moment but if you're crossing the threshold of somebody who has a reputation of being a hermit um, it feels like a very big deal and the the phrase was in those days that he was the hermit of Harlem and he was well known to be a, a retiring personality um, and to be honest with you, I wish I could remember more about that evening than I can, <laughs> because um, predictably enough, we started drinking quite a lot quite early on in proceedings. And I do have one memory of him standing, uh, well, actually more, not so much standing, but sort of capering about with a gigantic mug of gin in his hands, sort of sloshing it out of, onto the carpet a bit, saying, I propose the children's section that wasn't it always the case that children's poetry was better than adults' poetry? Um, and then saying, I could win this. I put my luncheon in the fridge and go and look at Humber Bridge. <laughs> of course, he did write a wonderful poem, poem about the Humber Bridge. He did. And actually, I mean, to link that to, to another question, I mean, that, that poem, like the little quatrain, which has been much quoted in the last few days um, about the Queen, does uh, prove to us that had he a, a larger appetite for it, he could have performed a sort of public role perfectly decently. Um, but just while we're on that, that laureate subject, I, I think that knowing him to be the personality that we do know him to have been, it was the right decision for him 
to have made. He was never formally offered the job. People always say he was offered it and turned it down. He didn't. Um, he, he just made it clear to those interested in making the appointment that he wasn't up for it. Um, so they never, they never got around to asking him because they knew what the answer would, would be. But had he, had he done it, he would have, he had the sort of technical skills as it were, and also the sense of, as it were, social obligation, poetic slash social obligation to perform perfectly decently in the role, I think. But he would have hated it, that, that's the point. And you, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a very interesting moment because you know, you're not only uh, uh, the, the biographer uh, of Larkin, uh, distinguished poet, but you have been, you, have, you held the role of poet laureate mm -hmm. for 10 years. And uh, I'm going to quote, uh, there's, a, there's a, um, an article in The Guardian, which, which says from you, which says to have had 10 years, this is, this is when you prepared to stand down from the job. Right. To have had 10 years working as laureate has been remarkable. Sometimes, it, sometimes it's been remarkably difficult. The laureate has to take a lot of flack one way or another. More often it's been remarkably fulfilling. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I'm giving it up especially as I mean to continue working for poetry. Mm. Did it stand in the way? Did or, doing the job, yeah. I mean, I think of it as a job, did doing the job stand in the way of my poems? Absolutely no question, yes. Um, and if it hadn't been time limited in the way that it was, I think that would have driven me around the bend, probably. Um, it would have been, it would have turned into something that was largely frustrating. As it was, I knew that there, that I would, there was a kind of off ramp that I would be able to take at, at some point in the, in the future. Um, though having said that, it wasn't all um, difficult in the ways that I'm suggesting it, it might have been. It was difficult to write the poems about events in the royal calendar about which I had no strong feeling, because I've always been somebody who wrote out of strong feeling. Most of the people that I was having to write poems about were people I'd never even met, let alone had a sort of inside, inside feeling about their lives um, in, in connection with. But the... Um, but the doing side of the job, the school visiting, the setting up the poetry archive, the various other things that I spent a lot of time doing was very rewarding. Um, and I did, when, I, when my 10 years eventually came to an end, continue to do quite a lot for poetry in those sorts of ways. Very um, much so. But I'm, I'm speaking to you now from, from Baltimore, um, where I've lived for the last seven years, working at Johns Hopkins. Um, and when I came here, it was partly to put an to put an end to that aspect of my life because it was simply taking too much of my time. Um, I thought that I'd put a lot of energy into it and I'd done what I could do for poetry. I also felt at the same time that it's never a good idea for the same person to be doing those sorts of things for too long, partly because the sort of clientele of the interest, as it were, changes, and partly because anybody in their right mind would want to make way for younger people than themselves who have different sort of interests and want to make a different kind of emphasis. Um, so I think it would have been quite difficult if I'd stayed in England to say, um, I'm just going to walk away from all these things. But because I could say to the various organisations that I was involved with, I'm going to have to stop doing this because I'm going to live in America, it made it, made it much easier. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. I have led, in that, in that respect, I've led a much quieter life here in a been able to concentrate on my writing and my teaching. Yes, and other doors have opened. Yeah. Very, it takes a great skill to walk away from particularly something so prestigious as the laureate. Yes, it was a relief too, I have to say. But yeah, but quite. yeah. yeah. Um, back to, to Philip. Um, when you, uh, you, you were appointed as, as one of his literary executors, um, and then um, you, you, you wrote the, the, the biography of Philip Lark and A Writer's Life, which right. many, well, I suspect everyone on this call has, has read, has a copy of. Um, it, it, it did, that did revise um, or readdress uh, Larkin's reputation. Um, do you think that was um, necessary? Do you think that it was... Um, uh, problematic. Did you well, did you feel? Tell me about your 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 feelings now. I mean, it's, it's sure gosh, it was published. Um, well, it was 30, 30, 30 odd years ago. Thirty years yeah. ago, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yes, bo both those things that you mentioned it, it was. Perhaps I can put this in context a little bit. Um, there were three of us involved in making these sorts of decisions early on. Monica Jones, um, who, who again, in this context, needs no introduction to, to the people, to everyone listening. Um, and Anthony Thwaite, who'd been his uh, literary executor for a while. Monica was a trustee of the estate with the lawyers. Um, Anthony and I were only literary executors, which is a sort of junior position in this kind of hierarchy. Um, but because Monica by that stage was already quite ill, and not easily able to make the sorts of decisions that were involved. A lot of the, the decision making devolved onto me and, and Anthony. And we sort of checked in with Monica about everything. And sometimes she had very strong opinions one way or the other. And sometimes she just let us do, I mean, agreed with what we were proposing and, and went along with it. But, but I certainly felt, and I shouldn't perhaps speak to, to the others, for the others who are not here to make their own case, but my sense was that they agreed with me about this, that um, once we realized that there were things in the private correspondence that were going to upset people, um, racist things, misogynistic things, and so on and so forth. Um, it would, once we'd realized that, having, no, having not had previously a chance to read any of the correspondence, it became, there, there was a, de a decision to make about whether to hold anything back or not. And I was very, very firmly of the view that we should not hold anything back. Um, and I've never changed my mind about that, partly, I think, because um, I think Philip, of all the people that I've ever met, was one of the ones who had best access to the whole of his personality. He didn't re reveal it as an entirety to everybody, but he did have extraordinarily good access to the whole of his personality. What do you mean by that? That's such a wonderful... Such well, to, a the dark, to the dark things in himself, as well as the, the lighter, more humorous, sociable things in himself, to the things that he knew people would find disagreeable. Um, it was a form of absolutely brutal honesty with himself. Um, I mean, we can come back to that because I think you're right. It is a very interesting aspect of, of, of his personality. Um, so partly for those sorts of reasons, um, in, in other words, to make his afterlife in keeping with his life life. Um, but also because history teaches us that executors and others, such people who do try and keep back material, inevitably get caught out by other people. It, it always comes out somehow, whatever it, it is that people are trying to hold back. And usually it comes, comes out in a rather distorted way. So better, I thought, to kind of get it all out there, allow people to make of it what they would, and then um, see what effect that had on the poems. And you're right, it did dramatically revise um, people's reading of the poems. Um, I don't know whether you want to say anything else about that at this point, but, but I've got a lot more to say about that. I mean, briefly, my feeling is that um, the things that are offensive in the letters and and really are offensive in the letters, um, racist things in particular, cannot and should not be denied. But the question, once you've made that acknowledgement, becomes, for me anyway, whether or not they inevitably transfer wholesale into the poems. And I, as you've heard, no doubt heard me say before, I don't think they do. I think that very often, I'm inclined to say invariably, um, Philip seemed to write his poems out of, um, partly out of a wish to be unlike himself, to transcend himself in some way. Sure, there are a few poems, homage to the government would be an example where you can see right-wing politics of a pretty serious kind in their own right. but And also you might suppose that if a person thinks that, then they might think of a lot of other things as, as well on that side of the equation. Um, but by and large, I think the poems actually are structured in order to be an argument between, a de as to put it in pretty neutral terms, between a sort of depressive, reactionary, not wanting change side of his personality and a longing for transcendence and difference from himself. Um, and that's partly why people warm to them so much because they feel that they're involved in this tense argument, um, which much, much, much more often than not come, comes down on the side of life, I think, however gloomy his reputation might, might be. Indeed, indeed. I was, I was just, I was 
I was walking along, I was just getting a pint of milk just now, and I was walking along and I walked past some people who'd clearly been married, just uh-huh. been married, and um, there was no one attending them. There was just a, a woman and a man. Right. And, and, I, and I thought, what a wonderful day to get married. And I was thinking about yeah. his poem, Days. Yes, oh, yes. Right. Days, I mean, that, right. that, that's a wonderful, right. wonderful, optimistic Yes. It's, it's, it's what are there to be happy in. Yes, um, exactly. And, and many of his letters, um, particularly his letters to Kingsley, Amos, are right. very, very amusing. Uh, well, he was the yeah. funniest man I ever met. Um, and I mean, among the many reasons I miss him, that, that looms very large, I, I must say. I mean, a lot of the, my, my memories of the, the many meetings that we had in Howland later in London and sometimes in Oxford after I'd gone back to, to Oxford, um, are falling about with laughter. Um, I mean, partly because he was being uh, sarcastic or more than merely sarcastic about people that I knew who we worked with at Hull. I mean, in the way that colleagues sort of rat away about each other, but also in a much sort of larger way, witty um, and funny funny in that sense to um, making making word jokes and seeing the, the sad comedy of life for what it is. Mm. Um, I have some questions here, um, all from trustees. Just well, as we're talking about your biography, uh, one of the trustees has sent it uh, from, yes, from, from trustees of the PLS. Um, the young, younger generation might feel they don't need to commit hours to reading a long biography such as yours when they can use search engines. <laughs> yes. to bring up endless information about anyone in seconds, uh, very useful for journalists, um, right. although not necessary to be always trusted. Um, what is the re- relevance of long form biography today? And what does your biography do that no other source of information can offer? Well, that is a very interesting question and would could lead into a, a very interesting conversation about what how biography is evolving in the in the face of these competing ways of discovering information. Um, Perhaps the first thing I can say, which doesn't answer the question right on the on the nose, is that the primary duty that I felt that I had to Larkin's shade and people who were interested in him um, when I began writing, the primary responsibility I had was to get the storyline straight and to talk to everybody. Um, because even though there were bound to be and should be other biographies that came along in time and and into our the future that we now occupy there will be others no doubt in the in the years to come and should be um none of them had the opportunity that i had simply for temporal reasons to to talk to everybody um so my the first thing i did was to go and talk to everybody in his address book in fact another very vivid memory i have from early on is monica quite soon after philip had died literally chucking across the, his sitting room for me to catch his address book with bits of paper fluttering out of it and so on and saying, everybody you need to talk to is in there. And I just took it away and, and got in touch with everybody. Um, it was uh, completely fascinating for all the reasons that you might expect to do with the sort of unearthing of material that was valuable for the book, but also because it made me understand in an absolutely on my pulses kind of way, something that I'd only previously understood in in theory, which was that to an unusual degree, he lived his life in compartments. Um, I mean, everybody who's interested in this knows that Kingsley, for instance, never came to Hull, despite Philip having lived there at the end but for 30 years and being his best friend and so on. But that that example dramatizes a general tendency in his way of proceeding in life, I think. and what I needed to do was to both find the material that was there to be found, but also be sensitive to the fact that I was going to be informing quite a lot of people of things that were parallel to their relationship with him that they might find difficult, um, upsetting, um, wounding even. Um, and that, and this should be no surprise to people, and that a lot of these people, and it was a major reason why Philip was drawn to them in the first place, were people who are absolutely not used to living in anything resembling the glare of publicity. Um, so I felt that quite a lot of social adroitness was called for and kindness, um, as well as a sort of intent literary interest. Um, I mean, that did make the writing of the book an extremely interesting thing to do. So one way of answering the question that you've just put to me from your 
uh, trustee um, is that I felt that I sounds pompous to put it like this, but I felt I felt that I owed it to posterity to get everything down there in the right order, um, and I did my best to to do that. Um, I I knew that I would be upsetting some people in the process. This takes us back to your earlier question because there would be revelations about his personality that they would find um, unexpected and, and unpleasant in some cases. But I always believed that the poems were good enough and had that argument quality that we were mentioning to, to ride that. And I have to say, I think that's turned out to be true. Um, there was a huge rumpus initially after Anthony's edition of the letters came out and then another one when my biography came out. And people, in my view, quite rightly go on pointing out the things in the in the sort of hinterland of the poems, which are, um, to put it mildly, often or sometimes disagreeable. Um, but the poems as poems, and particularly because of this argument they have with themselves, have entered the national bloodstream mm -hmm. um, in a way which is really remarkable. Um, it is genuinely quite difficult to think of anybody um, over the last many, 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 many decades, whose work is so often quoted, has become such a sort of touchstone for absolutely. And we were just saying when we're in the in the in the in in the hiatus earlier on, <laughs> we were talking about um, the fact that Larkin is being dropped from the GCSE syllabus. Yeah, yeah. And I was suggesting that perhaps it doesn't matter because because he has so many access points yeah. which other poems do poets do not have and that's perfectly and, right and that larkin yeah. you know um i've got a question here from thomas gordon a trustee um he he wants he he thinks you've been on he says you've been on you uh, have been on quite the journey in your relationship with larkin <laughs> um, from being uh, first of all an admirer then a friend uh, you then commented your view of him changed when you wrote the biography in the 1990s, although you have you have uh, uh, explained that it's not you haven't gone from black from 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 it's not a black and white thing, but it's a sort of a, a modified thing. Um, uh, I feel the public has gone on a similar journey. And in that light, what do you think of the public reaction to Larkin? in this centenary year. The fact that, as Thomas then points out, that Kingsley Amis, who is in his lifetime much more commercially successful um, than Larkin, um, the his centenary of his birth, also this year, has been barely commented on. Um, why do you think Amis uh, kind of, you know, sort of man, sort of jovial uh, man of letters and, and public figure, has been uh, now seems slightly dated, and Larkin seems very relevant. Yes, more than slightly dated, I would say. Actually, um, I have a colleague here in the the department I work in at Hopkins who who, who tries to teach Amos, and the students just don't get it. Um, <laughs> but they but they do. I mean, admittedly, you know, it's three and a half thousand miles away, and it's a different culture, and so on and so forth. But um, but they do get Larkin. Um, I mean, not with the sort of tenderness that English audience, British audience is getting, but they, but they do get in. There is a major difference there. That, that too is a very interesting question, I think. Well, it, it has partly to do with what we were begin, beginning to talk about a moment ago, um, the quotability, the, the sort of ac the accessibility of the poems in that sense, um, as well as in all the other senses of that word. Um, it has partly to do with the fact that Amos's, if I can call them political emphases and prejudices and so on, um, show up much more obviously in the novels, I think, than Phillips do in the in the poems. Um, and that too might make them, in fact, I'm sure it does make them seem, well, one, one word for it would be old fashioned, um, but just sort of off, off the pace, out, out of sync with the way people think now. Um, for me, the question is, then becomes one about what it is in the poems that makes them so memorable. Um, and what I'm about to say is something that everybody listening will have thought for themselves, I've absolutely no doubt, but just so that it, it has been said aloud. It is very interesting, I think, how the poems in their often sort of dialoguing binary structure end up aspiring towards a, um, an epigram, something which is a distillation of the argument that they're having. Um, if it's a conclusion, 
we need to sort of be careful how we use the word, I think, because Larkin's conclusions tend to be ones which are rather ambivalent. Um, they often conclude in ambivalence, in fact, don't they? Um, but the fact that they do aspire to the condition of an epigram, whether it be um, our almost instinct, almost true, what will survive us is love, or books are a load of crap, or they fuck you up, your mum and dad, or whatever it is, um, they have that tendency, to, they gravitate towards a memorable phrase um, quite deliberately. So I don't think we should be too surprised that people sort of pocket the poems um, or lodge them in their minds in the way that we do. They are des absolutely designed to do that. They're designed to stick. Um, I think he, he, Philip, thought that it was a very important part of what his poetry as as aspired to, to achieve, memorability. And if you make that point as a freestanding thing, um, it doesn't sound all that remarkable, but if you put it beside the kind of ambitions that say, well, that his, his great British and Irish near contemporaries had, Ted Hughes and Seamus Heaney, I mean, they're both of whom are very fine poets in their own way. They simply don't do that. I mean, they don't, they, it's not part of their, part of their plan. I, you are, I think you're absolutely, it's a, it's, it's a spotlight um, on those, to, to look at the end as, as this epigram, you know, somewhere mm. becoming rain. Right. Well, at the end of here, we're, we're, we're just, which is just unfenced existence. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the actual word, but that yeah. final stanza. Right. And, and, and this idea of tenderness is so, yes. so right. It's such an apt yeah. word to describe his, why is it tender? It shouldn't be. He's talking about death. He's talking about people sitting in 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 old people's homes right he's you know why right. so it, it shouldn't be tender but it it is why well, he's, he's perfectly capable of quite savage satirical remarks in the poems as he was in life and he's certainly capable of all sorts of discomforting ironies in the poems um not, none of which might be construed as having this uh sort of tender aspect to them um but when he's not writing like that, um, I, my very strong feeling is that tenderness is, is one of the sort of abiding qualities that the poems have. And it, it connects in my mind with something that I remember feeling the very earliest times that I read him, which when I was a schoolboy, 55 years ago, God almighty, um, um, and thinking the life that he's describing is not like my life in certain ways. I mean, he. You know, he's a suburban, originally a suburban writer. Mine was born in the countryside and brought up in the countryside. Um, he's my father's generation. It was only a year out from my dad. He, um, he, and, um, and, and has some of the views that my father had and so on. And yet when I'm reading the poems, I feel that I'm recognizing them. I can distinctly remember feeling the, the earliest times that I read them. And I've never lost this feeling of thinking, yes, life is like that. And I think what that leads into in the poems or the way that it's structured in the poems allows us to feel, um, and this even applies to the times when he's being satirical and so on, that he's somehow on our side because he's telling us the truth about lives that we can recognize, you know? Which, which poems, how, how has his writing influenced yours or hasn't it? I mean, it, well, that's a very difficult question for, for anybody to answer, I think. I mean, it, it's probably easier for people other than myself to, to answer that. Um, I, I sometimes think that I worked quite hard not to um, be too influenced by the poems, deeply as I admired and do admire them. Because I'd seen, and I say this with the deepest respect, because I'd, I'd seen what had happened to some of the writers of the generation between mine and his, including Anthony Thwaite, um, whose poems are definitely, not all of them, but a lot of them are definitely colored by Larkin's example. Um, and that's true for a large number of people of Anthony's age. It's as though to this tall tree in the forest of, of poetry um, shielded the light from people who, who stood too close to it. And, um, and altered the, the natural shape that they might, might otherwise have adopted. Um, and I thought that by moving a little bit away, I, I wouldn't be in the shade in, in that sense. 
But having said all that, what I am absolutely sure, and I demonstrate this to myself every time I go into, into a classroom, um, what I'm sh absolutely sure has influenced me very much is the way that he was in no doubt, I think, that poetry was the most important thing in his life, but he bloody well wasn't gonna let people see that um, unless they got sort of up close to him. In other words, don't make a fuss about it. Don't show off about it. Don't be ostentatious about it. Um, and, but if you can make a marriage between that lack of sort of showiness um, with all the preposterousness that might come with it and a, a true devotion, that, that, that notion of things went into me very deeply. I can remember M Monica standing in the sitting room after Philip's death and pointing to the copies of, he, of his own books that he'd put on the book shelf among the other people whom he especially liked and saying a little bit cattily <laughs> you can see what he thought of himself um in other words you can see how how good he thought he was and i can remember as she said that thinking and he was so what's the problem <laughs> but i mean i was very fond of monica and i didn't i didn't feel it in a hostile way but it seemed to me proof of what i always thought which was that a manifestation of what I always thought was that he, it was the supremely important thing, um, but it was going to be done quietly without showiness. Do you think in that he was influenced by T.S. Eliot? Well, it would be odd if he were, given how scathing he is about modernism, wouldn't it? And yet a lot of the time um, he reminds me of Eliot, actually not so much of, not so much of Eliot himself. And it's in the way that Eliot had a sort of day job. Um, yes, there's that. No, absolutely. But and there is something deeply sort of proof, proof rockian about the the enterprise of the poems. I I think so. Yes, I've just finished reading the second volume of Robert Crawford's very good biography of Eliot, and exactly the point you're making kept coming into my mind. I must say, I can think, oh, that's a bit, that is rather like him, and and so on. So, so yes, the 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 lack of uh, the, the the dailiness of work, um, the uh, the lack of ostentation, certainly, but. But Eliot was, you know, writing much more and of a different kind of critical prose to fill in the gaps between the poems in a way that, that Philip didn't. Graham has pointed, Graham Chesters has pointed out that your poem Holderness um, mm. is, is, cannot help but be linked to Larkin's work. And he has then said, rather well, slightly, not exactly rudely, I think, but he said, <laughs> what, is poetic, what is poetic about Holderness? Um, I mean, I think there's quite a lot. Oh my God, what isn't poetic about Holderness? <laughs> I can, when I was in, when I lived in Hull, um, again, a thousand years ago, I quite often used to go out to Holderness. Um, Do you want it, to explain to, to, to sorry, the LS yes, members where Holderness yes. is? I'm sure well, everyone knows, but just so that we can all envisage it. Well, this will make everybody who's listening to this, who's living in Hull, curl their toes and hate me. But when I got to Hull um, for the very first time, um, I thought it was on the coast. I didn't realize there was something like 30 miles of land before you fell into the North Sea. Um, and one of the first things I did after I'd moved up there was to go and explore that amazingly lonely bit of landscape. And it, I just, well, I fell in love with it. I mean, I, it was easily my, my favorite occupation in my whole days to go out there and mooch around, either in, through Holderness itself with those beautiful churches. Yeah. And I often remember talking to Philip about this too, because I think he had rather similar feelings than I did about it. So that church at, oh God, I'm going to forget all the names now. Well, it's there's the Queen great. of Holderness. The Queen of Holderness, exactly. Yeah. That's the one I'm thinking of in particular, yeah. which has holes in the spire and the steeple, yeah. doesn't it, to let the wind blow through. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, um, Spurn Point, which was in, in these days, in the in the late 1970s, a completely different shape to what I understand it is now, because it keeps being nibbled away and restored and moved around and so on as the tides do their work. But PLS, I thought- I'd just say that PLS members might know and, and uh, that uh, Andrew Marvell, his father yes. that was, uh, he right. came from, from Holderness. He did, from Wine, Winestead. Winestead, exactly, yeah. yes. That's right. Um, and uh, so there's something about that area and poetry. Yeah, right, absolutely. Well, will it, yeah. William Empson's family is from thereabouts as well. So it's it's, a, it's not exactly a nest of singing birds, but it's thereabouts. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so 
so yes, yeah, so Holderness an inspiration for you. Um, yes, and it's true that that poem, insofar as I can remember it, just to try and meet Graham's nice point. Um, I felt that if I was going to write about that subject, then it would be a sort of dodge not to somehow include Philip in it, um, ref referentially or in terms of cadence and so on. And just to finish what I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm sure that there are um, examples of how his cadences have got into my own bloodstream. And it'd be, frankly, it would be weird if they hadn't, since I've spent so much time thinking about him. I mean, that book alone took almost every day for seven years to write. Um, and since then, you know, I think about him every day, and very often I I, I read, uh, I should think I read his poems, I mean, not from cover to cover, but I read one or two of his poems probably once a week. Um, and if you do that, it's going to get into your bloodstream. Which, which poem is your current, or what poem you currently, is your current favourite? Well, it's a very good way of putting the question that, because it does swing around with me a little bit. Um, I'm very keen on reference back. Truly, though, our element is time. I love the end of that poem. Um, we are not suited to the long perspectives open at each instant of our lives. But I've been rather obsessing over the last few days over the poem Afternoons, you know, something is pushing them to the side of their, side of their own lives. Um, which is a very good example of the tenderness that we were talking about earlier, I think. Um, and I was staring at it the other day and thinking with a, a different sort of clarity than I'd ever had before. That album lying near the television um, with our wedding written on it makes it sound as though um, the, the family to which it belongs were a couple on the train in the Whitson Weddings, <laughs> and the, which, which, is, which poem also appears in that same volume, of course. I mean, I, I now think of that poem as a kind of rider almost to, I mean, it's, it's what happened next to at least one of the couples that got off the train um, and has their, that journey, those, those sites in that magnificent poem memorialized in their album. Um, yeah. It seems so, and actually not alone in this, um, there, there are notes of misogyny in the letters. We, we, we know that. and and. We might well wish there weren't, but they are there. Um, but when we read that poem, there seems to be nothing but tenderness for the, um, the women who appear in it. And that's very often the case in the poems. So it's a good example, that poem, of this tension we were talking about earlier, this sort of self, this conversation with self that we were having, early, that we were talking about earlier. He does conjure up um, uh, uh, during the, the, the year, the, the whole City of Culture year, there was a remarkable exhibition at in the library, um, curated by Anna Farthing, which used. Um, I saw it. Oh, I saw it. Yes, yeah. no, I thought it was completely wonderful, a absolutely fascinating. And and it, it, there was there was so much in it which was so sort of of a certain era. There were things in that in that uh, exhibition, which I have seen in my parents' house, right. you know, sort of ice buckets and telephones, and just exa you know, exactly. electric fires. Exactly. Um, it, is an in, it is an England of a certain time. How do you translate that to students in, in Baltimore? How, do, when they're reading his poems, <laughs> how do they understand what is, is being talked about? Or does it get in the way or does it help? Well, of course they're used to thinking about poem, poets in their historical context. Um, and because they're all born in about the year 2000, um, and I don't wish to sort of traduce their, difference by, their differences by saying this, but I think it's as, it's as, it, it would be as bizarre for them to think about those sort of objects, that, that sort of context, as it would be to think about John Donne standing up in St. Paul's, you know? Um, in other words, it, they're equally peculiar and odd and re require the same sort of efforts of imagination to, um, to understand them. Um, he does feel very English over here. I, I mean, must... jokes like, you know, that vase, or, right. <laughs> or right. I ate, ate an awful pie. We right. you know, that... all know what that I know, means. exactly. No, that, that sort of stuff does go flying over their heads. Um, and I laboriously <laughs> try to explain <laughs> what the significance of this is. And they sort of get it, I think. But what they, what they 
do enjoy is the well-madeness of the poems um, and the way that they use quotidian material um, in order to talk about recurring, in order to deliver recurring truths about human experience. Um, and with a lot of the poems, and I'm particularly thinking as I say this about Obad, um, you'd have to be made of stone not to be able to see what was going on there and, and feel it in your guts. Um, I thought about Obad as, as I watched the royal funeral. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, what would Philip think of this? And I yes. thought about his plaque in Poets' Corner right. there, at the Abbey. Right, um, I know. I, well, I think he would have felt like so many of us, um, and particularly during the day of the funeral itself, intensely moved by it. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how much he would have been able to bear the, the apparently endless sort of vox popping. Um, but that too had its touchingness, didn't it? And I th he would have understood that. Um, and he certainly would have felt, as a very often been said over the last few days that um, whether we like it or not, and in ways that we can't yet fully understand, there is a very distinct sense of an epoch ending. Something is ending, something, something else is coming into view, which is also pretty unclear at the moment. But, um, and that, that's what he is trying to get at, I think, in that quatrain that um, is written on the stone in Queen Square, she did not change. Andrew, I have I've got one more question for you. Um, uh, and really, I suppose what I want to say is, is that you, um, for so many reasons, you're a poet. Firstly, I suppose, yes, no, you worked and lived in Hull. You wrote an esteemed award winning biography and loved biography of Philip. You knew him. Um, you, you, you stand sort of holding hands with him and 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 passing his his great work. There'll be many people across the world who 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 go to sleep with a book of Larkin and probably a book of yours uh, by their bedside. How does that make you feel as a, a as a as a fellow poet that you've got you've so you have this role? That's a very moving question for me to think about. Um, one of the questions that you were asking earlier gave a little map of how my feelings about him might have changed. And I can see how that might seem to be so. Um, I mean, from being young and in awe of him to being a friend, to writing a biography, having to sort of release to the world some quite difficult material. Um, and then the long sort of uh, comet tale of the biography. Um, I've, I'm not sure that my feelings about him have changed very much, actually. <laughs> um, but I might say that, mightn't I? I mean, I've, I've, I know more about him than I used to know. I feel differently about him as I get older myself. I'm now seven years older than he was when he died. Um, shocking thought. Actually, as a parenthesis to that thought, um, isn't it interesting I mean, I know that there are a handful of very good poems written during the last part of his, during the last decade of his life, including, of course, Obad. Um, but the, the regular beat of his poems stops when he's in his early fifties. We wouldn't be, it wouldn't be ludicrous to, to describe him as a young poet. And yet his manner was so extraordinarily valetudinarian. Um, I mean, that, that's something else I remember about the very first time I met him thinking, my God, this man's a, um, a year younger than my dad, but he seems about 25 years older. You know. Um, anyway, um, so the circumstances in which I read him and the depth at which these things go in has changed, but the basic template of my feelings for him have really, I think, not changed very much, which is a compound of, um, as it were, writerly admiration for the, the technical skill, the way of organising material, the absolutely brilliant synthesis of a sort of novelising capacity with a, a lyric capacity. Um, the faithfulness to things that seem ordinary but turn out to be rather miraculous um, and the things on and 
also turn out to be the things on which we base our, our lives. Um, the tenderness that he shows for other people, all the things that we've been talking about. Um, and that's remained constant. I mean, that, I, that's what I felt to start with and that's, what, that's how I feel about it now. And I, I, when I'm reading him in this sort of re repeatedly and regular way, I feel for all the melancholy of the poems, um, comforted by them because they tell the truth as I feel it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. You, well, bless you. You've, well, you've, you've thrown, I don't, I'm, I'm sure, um, I, I suspect I'm speaking for everyone when I just say you've helped us see, you've thrown light on the poetry, you've thrown light on the man, you've, you've helped us understand a bit more about you, your work, your impulses, your well, teaching. And very nice to say. I'm very, um, very grateful to you. And well, I'm very grateful to you. And, I, and can I just apologise again to everybody? Oh, for... It wasn't your fault. This is <laughs> I'm so glad you, I'm so glad you came back to us. Um, well, I, thank you all. You, yes, thank you all very much. My greetings too from all this long distance away. It's very nice to be in your company. Thank you very much. I'd like to just, we could all appreciate you. Uh, thank you so much well, for helping us pleasure. celebrate the centenary in this well, very, I mean, very special hats, hats off to him. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.